The graduation address gives us the opportunity to hear from a distinguished member of our alumni community. And we are very fortunate today that the address will be delivered by Professor Sharon Lewin. Professor Lewin is an internationally renowned infectious diseases physician and is in the inaugural director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity. She is also a Melbourne Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne, consultant infectious diseases physician at Alfred Hospital, and a National Health and Medical Research Council Practitioner Fellow. Her research focuses on understanding why HIV persists on treatment and at developing clinical trials aimed at ultimately finding a cure for HIV infection. She has given over 100 invited talks internationally on the topic of an HIV cure and published over 280 papers. Professor Lewin has also recently established a new research program on diagnostics and treatment for COVID-19. She is passionate about science communication and community engagement and has presented to both national and international media. In 2019, she was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to Medical Research and to Education in the Field of Infectious Diseases particularly HIV AIDS. I now have much pleasure in inviting Professor Sharon Lewin to deliver the graduation address. Provost, friends, colleagues, the newly minted graduating class of 2021 and their very proud and I'm sure very relieved families. Congratulations and how wonderful to be in a hall like this together. I still find it somewhat a little confronting being with so many people but at the same time totally exhilarating on so many levels given what we have all just been through. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to have the opportunity to share with you in your celebration of what will always be a momentous day for each of you, the beginning of your medical and scientific careers. And in fact, I can think of no greater honour than being asked back to one's alma mater to speak at graduation. So thank you for the invitation. Well, I sat in the very same, somewhat intimidating Robert Blackwood Hall to graduate from medicine as what was then MBBS in 1986, and again with a PhD in virology from Monash in 1997. And I hate to say what I know is a terrible cliche, but I have to say it anyway. Um, it literally feels like yesterday. Unfortunately, it was 35 years ago. However, over the last 35 years, I've learned to appreciate three great gifts I was given that day in December 1986. The gift of becoming a doctor, the gift of immense possibility, and the gift of a Monash education. Of course, you too are the recipient of those same very gifts. And so today, I'd like to reflect on each of them. First, the great gift of becoming a doctor. Being a doctor is an absolute privilege. In the coming years, your patients will share their most difficult times of their lives with you. Nothing is more confronting and frightening for people than being unwell. Your patients will share their most treasured secrets with you. And I can tell you as an HIV physician, I've heard many. They will share information with you that often their families and loved ones don't even know. And they will put immense trust in you. They will trust that you will always be compassionate, empathetic, and will know about and deliver the best available treatment options to them, always. It's a big responsibility. 
As you just heard from the Provost, I'm an infectious diseases physician and virologist. I've spent most of my career working in HIV medicine as a clinician and scientist and still practice. And along the way, I've worked with a few other viruses, most recently SARS-CoV-2, which has slightly dominated my life in the last 22 months. But back in 1986, when I was sitting in the very spot you are now sitting, I was actually oblivious to those two pandemics I was ultimately going to spend my career working on. HIV was not even on my radar. It wasn't until I spent a year working in Kenya as a doctor in 1989 that I really realised the scope and scale of this pandemic. And in Africa at that time, the disease was so highly stigmatised. No one wanted to be tested and no one actually wanted to talk about it. At the time, HIV was a universal death sentence and a horrible, lonely death for so many people. However, by 1996, just seven years later, through investment in science, the discovery of antiviral drugs dramatically changed the face of HIV. Most of my patients literally got off their deathbeds and now live normal, healthy lives. HIV has become a chronic manageable disease through the great success of science. However, it's not, it wasn't just science alone that transformed the face of HIV. Through brave advocacy, initially from the gay community and their doctors in the early 80s, and subsequently the global community, which still continues, new treatments became widely available. And now over 70% of people living with HIV are on effective treatment, including in low income countries and in that little hospital in Kenya I worked at so many years before. We still don't have a vaccine and we still don't have a cure. Treatment's lifelong as the virus rapidly returns once antivirals are stopped. And I've pretty much spent my career trying to work out why and how to stop the virus coming back. It's easy to forget that the HIV pandemic is far from over with 1.8 million new infections every year and 650,000 deaths. Now, I'm immensely proud of so much that HIV has achieved. First of all, the HIV field led the way in what we now take for granted as patient-centred care. They ensured the voice of people affected by the virus were part of our decision-making in their clinical care and in the clinical trials we designed and performed. The mantra, nothing about us without us, started with that very community. And up until about 22 months ago, I was equally as proud of what science had delivered. The development of effective antiviral drugs was just extraordinary. Not only does it control the virus and people live normal, healthy lives, but can also prevent HIV infection and have literally saved millions of lives. However, these great advances took close to 40 years. COVID-19 has taught us we can do much better than that. When the world galvanises around a single problem and with investment in science, we can do extraordinary things. And what we've seen in the response to COVID-19, as difficult as this period has been, is unprecedented and a reminder of what is possible. Eight licensed vaccines, effective antiviral treatments, advances in diagnostics in such a very short time. But COVID-19 has reminded us again that science is not enough. There are great inequities still which drives this infection and one of the biggest is access to vaccination. I want to go back to the Geneva Declaration which we all um, uh, read just a few moments ago and just want to highlight the one commitment in there, and there are many wise words, in fact, in there. I hadn't thought about the Geneva Declaration uh, for many, many years. And that is, I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing 
or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patients. These are words for you to live by, as well as to practise by, as a caring and responsible doctor and member of our society. But as a doctor, I really think your responsibility extends beyond the bedside. You are also an advocate. You must be an advocate for the best outcomes for your patient, as well as the community that you serve. For some of you, this will be your local community, be it in a suburb of Melbourne or a country town in remote WA. But for others, your community will be global. In my own career, the combination of clinical care and research has meant that I've acquired deep expertise in just really one area of infectious diseases, which has suddenly become of such high interest to everyone. And through that work, have developed a global network. And this has enabled me to share my understanding of the science, not just with the patients sitting in front of me, but with the broader public and politicians, and also advocate for science, which I believe ultimately leads to better outcomes for my own patients. Your second gift for today is endless possibilities. Never forget that. Your career options in medicine and in science are vast. In your initial years, it will take time to know what your calling is. So let me offer some road rules you might want to sign up to in your career track ahead. First, stay open to all opportunities. I recently read a wonderful quote from Dr. Bob Wachter, now the Chief of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco, a great institution that I have worked with for decades. He said, say yes to everything before you're 40, and say no to everything after you're 40. I think this is pretty good advice, and in part what I've personally done, continued to say yes. The problem is, as my husband constantly reminds me, I haven't got much better since passing 40, but please continue to say yes. Sometimes saying yes will feel confronting or scary, but accepting some uncertainty in your decisions can make a very big difference to your possibilities. Back in the late 90s, I moved to New York with my young family to do a postdoctoral fellowship after completing my PhD at Monash. That decision felt slightly overwhelming. There were countless reasons why life would have just been easier not doing that. But that time for me was absolutely transformational. I worked for Professor David Ho, who was Time Magazine's Man of the Year, just the year before I went in 19. 95, for his discovery of the life-saving antiviral treatments for HIV that I mentioned earlier. The centre was small, but it was a mecca for clinicians and scientists from all around the world, Finland, South Africa, China and beyond. And this was to become my global family for close to 30 years. And interestingly, when COVID-19 hit, the very same network was reactivated and it allowed me to know the latest knowledge from every part of the world and also establish a range of collaborations. And I continue to meet with David and other colleagues from ch largely China every week um, over the last 22 months. Second, stay curious. Medicine will change greatly over your career. You can and must contribute to these changes. As long as you keep questioning what you see around you, learn how to answer the questions or who to answer them with, and remember that your medical education doesn't stop today. You have a lifetime of learning ahead of you. And third, always stay kind. We've learned that so strongly in the last 22 months. Of course, Always stay kind to your patients, but always stay kind to your colleagues too. You spoke earlier in the Geneva Declaration about your brothers and sisters. They will be very important for you. And of course, always stay kind to yourself. You can't look after others if you yourself are not in good shape. Finally, a few words about your gift of a Monash education. What I loved most about my time at Monash in the early 80s was that Monash was, and I am sure still is, a true meritocracy. 
I was never judged on what I looked like, on my gender, where I went to school, or what I had done in the past. I was judged on who I was now. I learnt to value excellence. I learnt to question and challenge dogma. I learnt that as a doctor, you are also a leader. And I also subsequently learnt that as a Monash medical graduate, you are part of a global community of colleagues that share your values and are there always to mentor and inspire and support you. So in conclusion, in my 35 years of professional life and practice, I have absolute confidence that the professional lives that lie ahead for you are full of promise and immense satisfaction. I'm sure each of you will not only do well, but you will and must also do good. Anything is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lewin. That was an outstanding graduation address. I think all of us here have benefited from the generous uh, wisdom you've imparted. This Dr. Professor Lewin really is one of our most outstanding alumna, and the work that she is doing now is work for which we should all be extremely grateful. So thank you very much. <laughs>